It is April 11th, 2023. We are the second show into Q2 and Bitcoin has officially cracked 30K for the first time in 2023. Yeah, what do you think is going to happen next? We just cracked 30K last night. Well, I did a post yesterday talking about you know, Bitcoin looking like it wants to break out. I talked about like the mini breakout and then the, you know, actual breakout. So essentially we moved up and we've been consolidating for like two weeks, you know, kind of in between that call 27.5 and 29.5. So we were pushing the high end of that last night and then we finally pushed through it. So in theory, we broke out of, out of the short-term consolidation, assuming, you know, candle stays above that. But when you look at the longer term chart, 31.5, 32, where you have a lot of um, potential resistance, you know, that 30, it's kind of tough because like that 30 was sort of a support. There's an old range from like 30 to 32. So like the bottom end of it, it's like, all right, well, that, I guess that was support, but the top end of it was, you know, that 32. So I'm I'm really looking for price to ideally push to at least 32 and then if it runs into resistance there it makes sense but either way i'm excited to see a push up into the 30s i think getting above 32 like establishing above 32 and then consolidating there would be huge so i hope it happens because then i can borrow more against my uh bitcoin yeah so we die. were we were talking about that in our uh pre-show chit chat yeah so i i've written a bunch of posts about collateralized loans and using you know apps like Oasis and, and MakerDAO to, to do them. You know, it makes you look like a genius when the bull market hits because basically in the bear market, you're stacking a bunch of Bitcoin, right? And then you put it in the vault and then uh, take out loans against it for paying, you know, whether you're paying expenses or, you know, some people even lever up and get more Bitcoin with it and then put it back in the vault. So all sorts of stuff that you can do. One of the crazy things is that when Bitcoin eventually goes up, and you're sitting on, you know, all this Bitcoin in your vault, it, it can change everything because you, uh, you've you got that die loan and the die loan obviously doesn't increase in value unless you pull more out. So, you know, you can borrow $10,000 in the bear market. And then when the bull market hits and Bitcoin triples, you can pay off that, that 10,000 die really easily. So I actually wrote a post yesterday about it, but was talking about different scenarios. I actually used ChatGPT to do like scenario building, which was kind of fun to do. If Bitcoin hits this, then this, and like how much will it have to pay off? So I've got one of these vaults where I plugged in all the numbers. So at the, at the current price, the vault's worth one set, 170K, and I had 86K in, in die debt on it. And then I ran the scenario, you know, if Bitcoin goes to 58,000, the vault value would be 342,000. So to pay off the debt, you would only have to sell 25% of the whole vault, pay off the debt. And then I plugged in, what if it went to 100,000? And then uh, it said the vault value at, you know, the vault value would be worth 586,000. Debt, die debt would still be 86,000. So you'd only have to sell 15% of the vault to pay off the whole die loan. And then you're left with, you know, $500,000 worth of Bitcoin free and clear. So, you know, it makes you look like a genius when you basically stack a bunch of Bitcoin, throw it in the vault at the bottom of the bear market, and then wait for the bull market. You get to pull out your liquidity. Like you were, you were talking about how you thought it was really cool to finally be able to like pull out liquidity from crypto, right? Yeah, without having to sell the crypto. Exactly. And there's obviously a bunch of, you know, tax benefits and, and other stuff that comes along with that. If you want to play it smart and you don't have to claim taxes since it's a loan, and then you can also write off the interest payments. Yeah, it's going a whole nother level with it. But yeah, I'm glad uh, I'm glad I got it going. I'm glad that Bitcoin is up a little bit since then. And uh, if that continues, then, you know, like you said, you could either sell a little, a little bit to pay back or I could, you know, generate more stable coin and yeah. you know, have my liquidation price come up some. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've considered both. I'm not really sure what I want to do yet. If I want to sell a small amount, pay some of the die off or just, you know, keep waiting it out. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. I mean, Bitcoin's up basically 100% from the bottom. So yeah, pretty much. I'm sure I'm not the only one out in crypto land that is having regrets of not buying more sub 20 i always wish i bought more um if you're not in the thread yeah. cast then jump in so in the uh in the last leo stats report uh dolls put out the number that uh we hit a new all-time high for monthly active users we hit 1400 total users in the month of march that includes blogging and microblogging so microblogging only we were like 1050 users and then if you include all all the people who have been blogging but not microblogging that's like another roughly 350 people so we're looking pretty good on that front. Our goal for Q2, I was just telling you, is uh, 1,500 monthly active users on Leo Finance Alpha. And, uh, you know, we already hit that. So we're essentially close, 1,400. We are 11 days into Q2 and we're already hitting our goals. Definitely got some some good work to do, though. So our, our, our goals are, just to recap, 1,000 monthly active users by the end of Q1, which we did, 1,500 by the end of Q2 
which we're pretty much already there, 3,000 by the end of Q3, and then 5,000 by the end of Q4. And 5,000 is nothing in the grand scheme of things, but in, you know, relative to crypto, that's just huge. It's a huge user base, especially for like the social media side of crypto. You know, we're not talking about like DeFi wallets. We're talking about like legit active users who are actively posting stuff and engaging. Exactly. After, uh, you know, May 1st, when we're officially launched, I'm sure that's going to give a nice bump or just, you know, increase the momentum because now that's going to become the site as opposed to now where you still have traditional Leo finance site. Where a lot of people, you know, go, and I'm sure it's even some new people go, I'm more still active, you know, on, I, I'm, I, I use both, but I'm still more active on the legacy site, but that's probably just from familiarity. I go on to thread on alpha, but eventually I'll do everything from there and come May 1st, I won't have a choice. Yep. It's very true. I mean, alpha is just better for pretty much everything. I mean, we're slowly getting there, you know, in terms of like core features and everything it's obviously taking time to to build out all those core features but the the big game changer for me was adding drafts to the publishing ui because once we got drafts in there now i'm, I'm comfortable writing stuff whereas before i was i was still writing on the old ui just because i was afraid of you know losing content and stuff like that on alpha but so far so good and using drafts i haven't lost anything yeah i gotta make the transition i mean case in point i'm you know just out of habit i went to the legacy ui and start writing the recap post so i'll have to Next week, remember to make the transition. Yes, yeah, uh, Steve on uh, Threads said, uh, if you can get 5,000 people active in here, it'll be pretty wild talking about Threads. So yeah, I mean, it'll be it'll be really crazy. Like, And the thing about network effects is that the activity begets activity, right? Like if you don't have a lot of activity in general, that's kind of a problem for, for a social media site. And that's definitely one of like our key issues right now is, is getting activity to kind of kickstart the whole process. But awesome thing about Leo Finance is that we've been around for a few years now and we've built up a solid core user base. And then, you know, we obviously have Hive that we can leverage. So we we have the ability to have a nice core user base. And I think we already have that. And now we're just trying to add, you know, one at a time, add more people to it, make things more active. And uh, it kind of leads us nicely into uh, the meeting that we had last Friday. A couple of us got together, uh, Taskmaster, Mitch, me, uh, Eric, uh, nifty Phil, uh, the five of us got together and we were just talking about, you know, the whole Leo verse and all the stuff that we're doing and can, can do better. It was kind of like a feedback show, but it was not recorded. So it was just like a private feedback discussion. And, uh, we talked about a lot of, a lot of really good topics and where things are headed and, you know, some things that need to be fixed and stuff like that. And one of the big things that we were talking about was engagement and just general like activity and threads and you know so far a lot of activity is you know link posting and this this kind of hive culture of like post promotion channels is definitely a little bit of a problem like if you go to threads right now you, you do get like a lot of just like post links and stuff like that it, it's not too bad but it is it is getting to be a problem where you know there are a lot of people that don't engage they don't reply they don't do anything other than just drop in you know they write a post and they just drop over to threads and they're like copy paste that's all they do. And then they leave. And even if you reply to their, you know, link drops, they don't even reply back to you. So that's one of the things that we need to really work on is kind of changing that culture of, of just link dropping. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that. We talked about how we can attack that from different angles. So two main angles to talk about. One is that you can approach it by, you could approach it by the UI side, right? So you change the algorithm, you change the way the feed works. And if people are just coming in and not engaging and just posting links, you can make their uh, threads trend lower and lower, right? So less and less engagement makes you trend lower. And that's how we're going to attack it from the UI side, from the just culture side. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do, like upvoting people who are engaging and replying and, you know, being active on threads rather than upvoting people who are just link dropping, you, you know, you encourage the right beha behaviors. And then overall, just like onboarding people from outside of hive, because, you know, hive, hive people are awesome. It's like, get, get away from that. But there is like this post-promotion nonsense that, that is, has baked into the hive culture since the beginning, which is like a lot of people use discord for this sole purpose. They use Twitter for this sole purpose. And it's not surprising that they're now using threads for this sole purpose where they just think it's a way to get more upvotes. So they, you know, come over and just drop links and, and expect people to just go to their post and upvote them, uh, without really being engaging in any sort of way. So, uh, that's like a cultural thing that you got to shift. And then also definitely a lot of low hanging fruit on the UI side that we can do. So we, we started working on like this simple algorithm for the homepage. So 
you'll still have like latest trending following, but there's going to be like a for you page soon. And that for you page will start to rank people and you know, it'll rank authors and rank content differently. So basically people will start getting a score. Uh, so each author basically, or each user will get their own score and it'll be largely based on engagement. And from there, you know, you will basically be able to like, it's almost like a reputation score, but we're going to have our own algorithm. And I was even talking about, maybe we'll replace the reputation score, uh, that's displayed on the UI and replace it with our own internal score, uh, like a, a Leo score or something, which basically factors in like, like how many replies to replies are you getting? How many replies are you sending? How many comments are you getting on your blog posts and replying to how many upvotes are you getting and, and all sorts of metrics like that, that can be baked in and create like a user score that, that actually shows like users based on engagement. Um, reputation score is okay. I mean, if the thing about reputation score is it mostly just shows the age of your account. Cause if you've been around for a while and you've been putting up blog posts and, and getting up votes, then your reputation score is going to be pretty high. Um, like mine is like almost 81 and that's just cause I've been around for a while and blog pretty consistently. Uh, but it doesn't go to tell you like anything about my engagement or anything. Like if I were to drop off the map for three months, not post any comments, posts or anything, my reputation score would still be 81. That doesn't really tell you anything about my activity. So, and, and like we've always said, engagement is everything. So that's my, that's my motto with building all of this stuff is that it's all about engagement and getting people to comment and reply and, and do all that stuff. So engagement score, I think is going to be a, a game changer from the UI perspective in terms of getting that done. And then, like I said, culture. So two ways to attack that problem. And we're going to definitely do the UI one. And I think the the cultural one is up to you guys and up to the community to uh, upvote and curate and, and do things that encourage people to be engaging and replying with, to each other, not just link dropping. Yep. Uh, some of the other things we talked about, like this broader question, which I think is like a really good discussion point. I want to put up a post about this. And I think you were the one that mentioned this, Mitch, but what will incentivize people to hold and especially to buy Leo? right? Like what is, what incentives are there? What is the point of the token? And it is a utility token where, you know, you have it and it gives you influence on the platform and you earn it through, you know, you don't have to buy it. You just earn it, right? Like it's, that's one of the really amazing things about Hive and, and Leo is that you don't need to buy it to get into it, right? Like if you want to get into Bitcoin, you have to buy Bitcoin, right? But if you want to get into Leo, you can just start <laughs> earning it. And now you can earn it as simply as just posting a thread. But we were talking about basically the different reasons why anyone would want Leo. And I came up with four. So influence on the platform. So obviously you can, you can basically dictate where rewards flow and what people's behaviors on the platform can be. And that connects with my last point about the culture being encouraging uh, people to do the right actions is done from the community side, which is you use your upvotes to encourage people to do the right things that benefit the platform. Uh, the second is ad revenue. So we got a lot of updates on ad revenue and uh, just the whole Leo ads protocol in general, in terms of the way that ads are displayed. And then also just the whole protocol itself and then governance. So that's kind of one of those more long-term things, but basically governing the platform, deciding things, poll voting is kind of changing that whole game. So right now polls are just, you know, one account, one vote, but we're adding filters to polls where you can do like Leo stake weighted voting, where every person who votes doesn't have an equal vote. It's based on how much Leo power they have. So there's a lot of cool stuff that's coming on that front for polls and then Leo five. So this is like, you can LP, uh, you can, you can pool Leo. Uh, on different blockchains. So, you know, Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, and Polygon, you can pool Leo and earn yield. So that's another use case. And then you've got the Leo Fi lease, Leo Power leasing market, which works like D-Lease in terms of, uh, you know, people can put up requests to to lease Leo Power. That's kind of underutilized. I think one day in the future, that'll get more, more and more utilized. And then you know, one thing Taskmaster kept talking about was using Leo as collateral for lending, which is kind of funny because we were just talking about the MakerDAO uh, WBTC loans, but something like that is definitely a possibility in terms of like a DeFi smart contract that someone could create where you could throw Leo in there and then, and then borrow against it. But anyways, those are like the four key points, influence, ad revenue, governance, and then, you know, LeoFi. Uh, those are like the big, the big four reasons, in my opinion, for what incentivizes uh, Leo holders. Yes. <clears throat> I'm in the recap post. I'm going to ask if anyone has any others they believe are reasons to hold. And they can put it in the comments. And they can thread storm it live. Nonzo said about reputation score i think a team came up with something back in the day during the steam era that was never really implicated maybe the leo team can look into it and see what you can learn there yeah i'll, I'll try to find whatever uh, you're talking about but yeah i mean i think people have like mused about better ways to do the reputation score because it's kind of not great on hive 
like it, it it definitely can help but it's not great uh it more just shows you like if someone's been around for a while like i said um, did you uh did you see morty's uh roar score His yeah dad. that's awesome that's i like it yeah i like it what's um, your rip what's your roar score what's your roar score? i actually like that a lot you like that <laughs> a little mean, bit of a tongue twister roar score roar score it's also super catchy it is. and it's so much cooler than just saying like reputation or like and then people are like well, what what's the roar score and then yeah. basically then you explain to you know your rep on the platform i kind of like that i like it, i mean yeah. there could be other names but I didn't think about that. Yeah, maybe a cool name for a uh, replication score. I like it. You could always make a poll with uh, ideas. We can, yeah. But... Good way to leverage polls too. Um, Morty asked about the Leo wallet. So this Friday, we are gearing up to release the the wallet just in time for LPUD. And I, I talked about a longer term vision, which is having a simple and advanced toggle. So uh, this is how the UI is going to look You know, for alpha. And then uh, at, shortly after we go into production, we're going to work on the simple advanced uh, version, which will basically like when someone's onboarded, it'll default to a simple UI. And this one's more towards the advanced one where you, you know, you've got like Leo Hive, Hive Engine, and there's like all sorts of other stuff going on. The simple wallet will have like three different things that you can do. Uh, very simple, like send Leo, power up Leo, stuff like that. Like you won't even be able to like delegate Leo from the simple wall. It'll be like super, super simple. Like, and the point is like, if someone's onboarded recently, they don't need to be hit with all these different features. They need like a simple experience, especially in terms of the wallet. And, uh, you know, it, it can even have stuff. I, I was thinking about this a little bit. You can even have stuff like warnings when you try to do something like warning, you're powering up Leo this locks it for 28 days, you know, stuff like that. Um, or, you know, warning, you're about to send Leo, triple check the address you're sending to. And when you try to do it, it'll ask you to confirm it multiple times, stuff like that. And then the advanced wallet won't have all those, you know, extra warnings and features. Uh, the the advanced wallet will be for people that know what they're doing already. Um, I like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and so we can, we can, you can also like, because uh, I've seen it on, on some sites where like, and it's not even necessarily, you know, even crypto, but you'll get that warning. But then also they'll have the little checkbox that you can like check to like not see that warning again. But either way, pretty cool stuff. Yeah. So that should be ready Friday. Where is this? More T was asking, uh, does the wall page get some love in terms of search and filter like peak D? Yeah. So he's talking, or they're talking about the transactions, um, you know, at the bottom of the page, you know, can you filter and, and search? That's not going to be live right away, uh, but after production goes live, that's definitely going to be in there. So what we're doing right now, and this is a broader point leading up to the production release on May 1st, is getting all those core features ready. So anything that's considered like core to the experience, that's what we're doing. And then all the extra stuff is going to come after May 1st. Uh, then we'll start adding. And all those little features, like those are a lot easier to add than like the core, core features. So... That's where we're at with, with just broader in terms of development is just everything's based on core features and getting them rolled out. Good progress per the huge. Yep. So some good news on that front. A lot of people are waiting for the cub burn report. I figured I'd touch on it real quick. I'm still waiting on some data. We were supposed to have it out on April 5th, but I'm still waiting on one of the team members to send me a bunch of data. He sent me some of it, but not all of it. So I can't finish the report uh, until he finishes that data portion of it. So as soon as that data is in, report will go live. But it's it's pretty much ready, except for his, the section that he contributes is not ready yet. And that's, you know, I'm not going to have us push the report until that section's done, because it's kind of kind of key to the whole thing. So uh, I'm excited about the report, though. There's a lot of new sections in there that nobody's seen before. So I'm excited to show it. And then, you know, Cub flipped deflationary in March, and it will be deflationary again in April. So looking good on that front, burning more Cub than we're issuing. We got some topics if we want to move on to like some broader market talk. Yep. I'm just catching up on the recap post. So I feel like a good one to touch on is the fiat on-ramp stuff, how MetaMask is now doing fiat on-ramp and off-ramp. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. So, which is really interesting because at this time, like a lot of crypto companies and exchanges are getting rid of their fiat on-ramps and off-ramps because of all these banks and all the regulation that's coming in. But meanwhile, MetaMask adding some fiat functions which are desperately needed. Yeah, I know, you know, at some point I'm gonna start looking into some of those avenues in terms of onboarding fiat, you know, from uh, day one, I've pretty much been a basic cat, just using Coinbase, you know, and onboarding into USDC and then using that USDC to uh, venture off 
into whatever I want um, to get into, depending on what the protocols are and, uh, you know, guidelines, restrictions, probably going to be more enticing because obviously Coinbase has their holds and sometimes they lock up your funds up to a week and who wants to wait that long? Crypto is a 24 seven real time moving thing and a week in crypto is like months. But this just goes to show the natural progression of uh, an industry, you know, like DeFi didn't even exist a few years ago. And now we're talking about being able to onboard fiat through a DeFi platform. So it's just going to get easier and easier to basically be in crypto as the years go on and it becomes, you know, more ubiquitous. It's also going to create a more efficient market. There's still plenty of layups, but I mean, you know, 2017, 2018, I mean, talk about just like layups in regards to like arbitrage and just, uh, you know, market inefficiency and you know, if you know how to build a bot, you can pretty much print money and you could, you could literally manual. I mean, I did manual arbitrages, you know, over the years here and there, pick up a little money. It's weird because it's going to be easier and there's going to be more availability, but it's also going to create less opportunity in terms of like that easy money as the overall crypto market becomes more efficient. I'm not saying we're there tomorrow. We're probably, you know, many, many years away from that. But you can see it compared to like, you know, 2017, 2018 to now in terms of just market efficiencies and availability. I mean, there was people that were just arbing between centralized exchanges and making and printing money. And I'm not yeah. saying you can't still do that, but it's not layup opportunities with big name coins anymore. People are doing that shit with Ethereum. I mean, that's how SPF made the majority of his money. And those, uh, I think those layups aren't as uh, common anymore because the market's becoming more efficient as more and more availability comes online. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah, the market is just, uh, it's definitely maturing right in front of our eyes. I mean, even all the stuff we were talking about with MakerDAO and everything, that's all relatively new. I mean, MakerDAO is one of those things that's been around for actually a lot longer than most protocols, but all sorts of options like that have really just kind of started to rise to the top recently. Well, and you know, in the end, the price of Bitcoin dictates the, you know, excitement around crypto. And, you know, now that we just cracked 30K, which we're barely above, I mean, we're at like 3160 right now, but we're above 30k and trust me the normies have noticed because you know i've heard from some normies after you know having crickets all of this year and it's just like bitcoin being in the high 20s is one thing but it's like ah, it's only one down move to being back you know where we were now it's like holy crap you know we're at a new threshold because we're, we've we've gone up you know from twos to threes it's funny how the mind works we're literally only 2k higher but it completely changing mindsets yeah. amongst the masses already Literally. Yeah. It's all always, it's always those psychological numbers, you know? Yeah. And, you know, based on, you know, saying it kind of at the beginning, my kind of like just technical analysis, which hashtag not financial advice. You know, when I look at the chart, obviously we have all that price action in and around 31.5 from back in May of 2022, when we blasted right through that level and then you know it hit its head on it twice and then dumped all the way down to uh 19 and then back in ironically may 2021 when we bounced off that area over and over and over and over and then we finally looked like after it looked like it was going to break down and it got as low as 29 and change we ripped all the way up to the all-time high yeah so that's interesting that it's early April, we got May coming up and that level came into play in May in the last two years I think that that's just a random coincidence I just noticed. So kind of funny. But uh, yeah, there's so much price action from basically like 29.5 up to 32 and change. So um, yeah, we're, we're breaking out of the little sideways consolidation we've been in for the last two weeks. But the question is, do we hit resistance up at 32 or so like I'm not like I mentioned, like I wrote a post yesterday about Bitcoin breaking out and in terms of the short term range over the last two weeks, it's broken out because the high side of that was basically like 29.5. But in terms of a bigger picture breakout, um, I don't know that I consider a breakout happening unless we establish above 32. But the price action has been constructive. I mean, you know, we rallied, we ripped off the, off a of 20K, we went sideways for weeks, consolidated, and now we're pushing higher. I mean, that's what you want to see, it's like basically like a stair step. That's exactly what it looks like. It looks like the first step in a stair. So if we can push up to 32, consolidate there and then push up again, you know, and, you know, we can go higher than that. I mean, even like there's just so many levels in play. I mean, there was a ton of action at 34 and change back in the, like last year. We bounced off 34, like four, 34, five. 
multiple times. So that's potentially uh, an upside as well, which would probably be more consistent with the last move. I mean, we went from 20 to 29. So we go from essentially 28 up to uh, 34, not as big a move, but at least it's uh, somewhat comparable. So what do you think happens after we hit, let's say that we hit 34, where do you see it going from there? Ideally we consolidate, you know, and at least if we had 34, then I want to say, I want to see it stay above 32, you know, or at least 31, like high 31s. If we, if, you know, we can stay above that, because that'll be a good consolidation slash pullback test. Yeah. Small range, but that's where all the action is. So really, I just want to see us established, you know, above 31.5, but really 32. So, but yeah, there's a lot of real estate. I mean, after 34, there's a whole bunch of real estate up to into the 40s. I mean, really into the almost mid 40s. Uh, now there's a lot of action at 40 as well. But that's, it's gotten cloudy because obviously that moved down. The good news is though, you know, we basically in November, none of us realized it, but we, you know, we broke out of that downtrend that we were in since the all time high. And then we went sideways for basically three months. And now since then we're working our way up. And I mean, at this point now, I don't want to say we're in an uptrend, but you know, in theory we have a, uh, you know, kind of just an ascending channel, which ironically, we're actually right at the top at right now. We're right at the top of it. Huh? See what well, happens. Depends. Depends on how you look at it, either that or technically we broke out back in mid March and we've been like, basically it's been riding the, uh, on the upside of that trend line. So maybe that is the case, but yeah, either way, we are no longer in a downtrend. I'm not saying we're no longer in a bear market. Um, cause I don't know what constitutes the flip in crypto, but we definitely are no longer in a downtrend and we're kind of in an uptrend. Yeah. And uh, it's so hard when price is down at 17K at the tail end of getting your ass kicked since essentially late 2021 to decide it's time to back up the truck, even though you told yourself you would. <laughs> yeah. I wish people held me accountable. I said it on air a few times. <laughs> I used to say, I, 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 like, I go play ball and obviously like at basketball, you know, I'm the crypto guy or whatever. And I told all those guys, if we get sub 20, I'm literally backing the truck up. I was like, I'll, I was like, I used to like, you know, I'm obviously exaggerating, but I'm like, I will refi my house and put it all on Bitcoin. Yeah. And I wish people would have gave me shit about it because it would have done me a favor. I mean, I wish I would have refied my house and put it all on Bitcoin at 17K. <laughs> I can be sitting pretty right now. That'd be great. Yeah. Hindsight is 2020 like, though. Oh Yeah. Oh, it's like I said, in that environment, like you just got your ass kicked for a year and a half. Um, right. It's hard to have the right and, mindset. You know, and you're looking at levels. And like I said, I really thought we were going to get down to like 13.5. And I, that's where I had my bigger orders. I had my bigger orders from 13.5 up to 14. And they just never got filled. I just didn't want to have no dry powder if we were to break under uh, 16. Yeah. I mean, that's why I do the dollar cost averaging. You know, I don't have Smart. to think about it too much. I just have that strategy, stick to it and it does its thing. Set it. Yeah. Set it and forget it. You don't have to bother looking at anything. It works out. It definitely worked out better. And yeah, I wrote a post this morning about uh, MicroStrategy and Michael Saylor and they're officially not underwater on their Bitcoin anymore because they're, oh, they're I never knew average, they were. Yeah. Their, their average buy price was about 30 K. So. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. And I, I posted some charts in that post showing their buys because you can see that since they're a public company, they have to file every time they buy. So you can see exactly what prices they were buying at. And uh, a lot of their buys were over 50K, but their average price is still 30. So, yeah. We talked about that pregame. I, yeah. Like I said, I had my two biggest buys in my history of buying Bitcoin were in the fifties and that obviously didn't work out so great. But uh, yeah, overall, my average price has got to be green. I'd have to do the math, but I don't see how it's not just because yeah. I got in so early back in the day. Yeah, that's how it's, I've, I've always been, you know, positive Bitcoin. I mean, my, my, in reality, you could consider that my Bitcoin position is basically free. You know, it's like, I've taken out more than whatever I put in back in the, the old days. So it's one nice thing about being in this industry for so long. Yep. Yeah. A couple of people are talking about the wallet UI and they like it. Glad you guys like it. I think it's a, it's a really cool design. And, uh, you know, I talked about this a little bit last week, but we just hired on a new dev who, who joined the team and he's a UI developer, but he's also, uh, big into UX, uh, design. Um, so he's actually been changing some stuff on the UI and a few of the changes he's made have gone live so far, but there's a lot more, uh, that he's got. 
Um, so you're going to start to see some like really nice UX improvements um, from someone who's actually experienced and, you know, works in the field of, you know, creating good UX, which I think is something that we've all wanted on Hive for a really long yeah, time. Yeah, that's huge. You got to have a good user experience. Otherwise, people don't stay or come back. Although I guess Curve defunct that theory, uh, debunked that theory with uh, their 1982 looking UI. If you're the big dog and don't have any competition, then you can have a shitty UI and still make exactly. it. Exactly. You know? But I'm not going to lie. I didn't jump into any Curve protocols because of their UI when it yeah. first came out. And I was like, what the hell? I'm like, this looks shady as hell. Yeah, right. you could always ask the question, you know, would more people have gotten into Curve if it was like a really sleek, simple UI? I'm going to go with yes, because I would have been in Curve. So there's one <laughs> person right there. There you go. And obviously regret not getting in Curve early because that's really, you know, the way it worked out. Yeah. For those, those of you that are in early, I know a few of you. Yeah, I know Gerber cashed in on it. But yeah, that UI is a good setup, the, the wallet UI. I like it. I think it'll change. I think it'll change a lot of things for the better especially in terms of onboarding, which is where a lot of our focus is. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Nifty was asking about, uh, I'm assuming the MetaMask uh, onboarding, but I don't have any details on it. I just heard the news. Yeah. I'd be surprised if it's like just an integration of, you know, using like something like MoonPay or, you know, basically just integrating with a backend provider. I'm yeah, MetaMask is typically, is. The, yeah, that's what they typically do with pretty much everything is they're more just integrating features than creating their own. Yeah, I feel like there's, honestly, there's like some news out there, but there's not a ton of news right now. Um, I feel like everyone's just watching the price. And then you've got, um, I, I guess some big news is the the ETH staking, uh, the Shanghai update. So um, oh, that's right. Could, yeah, people are gonna be able to withdraw starting uh, in about 48 hours. So yeah, a lot of people are talking about how it's gonna have like a, a really big change on ETH economics in general. And there's a well, lot of big so players. Obviously, ETH has been going up into the Shanghai upgrade. So, you know, do you think it's going to be a buy the room and sell the news? Um, and we'll see ETH sell off, especially with, you know, this, uh, you know, bunch of essentially a bunch of ETH about to come liquid. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of different data out there. So one thing is uh, I'm looking at this article that Eric sent us. So CryptoQuant said that 60% of the staked ETH supply is currently at a loss if you look at like the average buy price. Oh, wow. So there's that. And then, you know, so there, there, there's like two camps, right? Some people think there's going to be a huge sell-off when this happens. Other people think that it's going to be bullish in general for ETH staking because once you're able to actually withdraw it, you know, there's going to be more more participants basically. So kind of like some give and take to the to the economy there. I don't know. I, I think it's mostly bullish for Ethereum. It just is pro forward progress uh, on a lot of things. So I'm not I'm not really concerned, to be honest. But definitely a play. Like if you wanted to short short or long ETH, if you're depending on which camp you land in, definitely an easy way to, easy news event to play around. You know what? Speaking of, I just realized something. I got to go check. I'm pretty sure my short hedge on Bitcoin probably got liquidated now that we oh. pushed into the 30s. Mine hasn't gotten liquidated yet, but it is, it's getting there. I think my liquidation price is 32. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I know I'm in the 30s. I just don't remember where. Like, I know low 30s. Yeah, I got to double check that, which obviously always sucks to lose some money. But at the same time, it was mini insurance. Right. Was, That's why it's a short hedge, the, right? Yeah. The Bitcoin is up way more than the little insurance policy cost. Exactly. I cool. probably will chill and not look to put on any more insurance until I see us at least testing like 32 and maybe I'll re-engage, you know, as soon as possible. Otherwise I'm waiting until we get up to 34. Sweet. All right. We'll see everybody on post. the 18th. All right, cool. Right. Thanks for joining everyone. And we will yeah. see you next Tuesday. Yeah. Thanks everybody.